You're listening to a proud member of the Fight Fans Radio Network. Hello, everybody. Welcome to another edition of the Untethered MMA Podcast. We are back on some sort of schedule. After, uh, if you listened to last week's episode, and if you haven't, I highly recommend you do. Uh, where we, we took a little avant-garde, a little little Matt Roth uh, alternative action. Uh, if you want to get in touch with the show, uh, you can call the number at 410-988-6525. And you can reach us on Twitter. You can reach me at It's Mike Fagan. You can reach Matt Roth at Matt Roth 512 And Derek Subatiki, not with us, but if you want to harass him, at Fightlinker Subbo. Uh, I guess one, the, the question I have, I have to ask you, Matt, is where is he? Uh, who, Subbo? I think he got a job. Yeah, yeah, he got a job. Got so, a job. Uh, Derek, Derek's been uh, training for two weeks. Hopefully, uh, after this week, uh, we'll be okay. Uh, he's been, he's been training UFC. He's been training UFC. He's been training UFC full contact four times a week. I, I, I should say, Matt, before we go any further, that uh, I've, I've been dealing with a throat issue the, the last couple of days. So if I ask you to, to talk for a while, uh, that's the reason why. Okay, you got it. Uh, but yeah, let's, uh, let's get in right into the, the, the big news. Let's just talk about Batman. Oh, man, Batman was awesome. And by the way, if you haven't seen the movie yet, you, you've had a week. Uh, I don't give a shit about spoilers anymore. Um, so if you if you're listening and you haven't seen the movie yet, there will be spoilers. Yeah, and uh, it's not spoiling at this point because it's been a week. Uh, I guess I should ask you, Matt. Uh, you know, when did you see it? Where did you see it? Did you did you see it in IMAX theater? Uh, yeah, I, uh, yeah, I saw it at three a.m. in on Friday morning in IMAX. Went home, took another, uh, took a four hour nap. And then went go went and saw it again at <laughs> noon. I I saw it uh, Friday morning at one a.m. Uh, we actually uh, I got together with the people that I went to see it with, and we watched uh, we watched Batman Begins and and The Dark Knight before we headed out. And uh, I you know I missed the first about half hour of Batman Begins. Uh, I had some shit going on, but uh, the the crazy thing is that we got through the the two movies, and we were all we caught we all kind of realized that it was now you know twelve at night and we kind of hit that point where we're like, oh shit, like I'm tired. <laughs> like, <laughs> why did we decide to go see a movie at one in the morning? And, you know, I was a little worried. I, I had read some reviews that said the first hour of the movie was, was kind of slow. And I, I was really worried that it was going to be like the Avengers. Cause the Avengers had a, a, a pretty good hour long stretch where I was like, all right, let's just, let's get to the cool superhero shit and, and wrap this shit up. So I was a little worried going into it. Uh, you know, we saw it in IMAX and uh, I, those two hours and forty five minutes just flew by for me. I had I had no problem with the pacing of it. You know, I, I the, the thing I heard was that that y- you start out with a movie and you know Bruce Wayne's reluctant to be Batman or or some shit. And and I, I read some reviews that said you know get on with it, Bruce. Let's just fucking get into this shit. But I thought the story worked, and I I, I thought it flew by. I, I thought it was actually the uh, the best of the series. I know that everybody uh, claim, uh you know critically acclaimed. Um, the uh, the Dark Knight. Uh, I thought that this was the be- the best of, of all of them. I thought that yeah, it did kind of start a little slow, um, but it kept me compelled, uh, and I really wanted to you know just find out what happened. My only complaint is, uh, I-, I thought that um, Bane. I don't like that stupid looking mask. I'm a comic book reader. I'm a comic book nerd, and so my whole thing is uh, Bane should look like the comic books, not wearing a mask that looks like you know. The most ridiculous thing in the world. Um, but besides that, I thought it was—I I thought it was a perfect movie. Like I'll, I'll say, straight up, uh, perfect movie. Yeah, I—I I didn't have any problem with the way Bane looked. Um, I, I actually really liked his voice. I thought that was one of the most uh, unique voices 
Uh, and one of the lo- I, I think it's going to be something that is going to you're, you're going to associate with Batman. Um, just you know, looking back on that movie 10, 15, 20 years uh, from now, kind of like to me how how Darth Vader's voice is kind of synonymous with the Star Wars series. Um, I you know there was a lot of there was a lot of talk about it being hard to understand. You know, they I guess they changed the audio mix um, after they they released the first eight or six minute preview. Uh, but I had no problem. And you know, I was in the first row of an IMAX theater and in a, you know, in a pretty uh, lively theater. And I had, you know, outside of a couple lines uh, that didn't really affect my enjoyment of the movie. I didn't have any problem understanding him. Did, did do you have any problem with uh, understanding his lines or, or did you have the same experience I did? Uh, no, I, I heard everything. Um, uh, I thought it was a great movie. I, I, th- I thought that the, the thinking was great. I, I heard, understood everything. Um, I don't know. I I I, I really I'm I'm having, a hard, I'm having a hard time finding anything to complain about. And we uh we we saw something on uh, uh what, what was it the uh, the fifteen things that were wrong. Yeah, I have it up. If you want to. Yeah. Like it, can, yeah. Can you can you can you uh, start running through those a little bit? And uh, this is on slashfilm.com. dot com. And uh, also, I sent this list to uh, or Brent Brookhouse saw it after I tweeted it. And he actually wrote me a really nice email where he kind of broke down everything, uh, which I retweeted again. So if you want to go back to my Twitter feed and, and find Brent's take on it, uh, it's a pretty good read. Uh, but yeah, <clears throat> the first thing that they had was uh, when and how did Bane find out about Batman's identity and applied sciences? Okay, so uh, Bane is in the comic book during the, uh, the, 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 the story arc known as Nightfall. He actually discovered who Batman was while living in, I believe, Argentina. Uh, so he knew who Batman was before uh, anybody else. He was actually one of the first villains to discover who Batman actually is. Most of Batman's uh, gallery of rogues, as they are called, have no idea that he's Bruce Wayne. Well, and the other thing about Bane, too, and <clears throat> I don't remember the movie doing a, a great job of getting this across, but but Bane's not just some strong dude that that destroys stuff. Like He's a pretty no, strong no. He's a strategic genius. Yeah. So the idea that, that he would, you know, find out this information about Bruce and, and find out about, you know, applied sciences, uh, not too unbelievable. Uh, the second point was uh, Blake, which was uh, Joseph Gordon-Levitt's character, uh, intuits that Bruce Wayne is Batman. Yep. So there was actually a, there's, there's a, a Robin character known as Tim Drake who, uh, who discovered who Batman was, and that's how he became Robin. He's the third Robin. And uh, that's how he became it is because he uh, he discovered he he figured out who who Bruce Wayne actually was, and uh, it's actually said in the comic book myth- mythos that he will end up being a better detective than Bruce Wayne himself, who is known as the world's greatest detective. Yeah, and and Brent, I, this is one thing that I I kind of liked from Brent's response. He said that uh, the Blake character in the movie is a is an amalgamation of like Dick Grayson and Tim Drake, uh, yep. which. Uh, one of the things that I really loved about what Nolan did is that he took uh, various things from from different uh, Batman stories and, and used them as he as he pleased and uh, you know really made things work in that sense. Um, the next point, uh, this was sort of a complaint about how they paced the movie. Uh, the, the, they titled it "Bruce Wayne is down, then back up, then down, then back up," uh, referring to at the beginning of the movie he's you know walking with a, a cane and he has to you know get himself back into shape to be Batman, and then later in the movie you kind of go through that again, but. I, that's not really how I took it. Yeah, I mean, okay, so the beginning of the movie, he's not staying in Batman shape because there's no need for Batman in Gotham. So, of course, he's, he's out of Batman shape and his, all the problems that were wrong with his body finally caught up to him. And, you know, it's been addressed in various comic books. As far as when Bane beat the shit out of him in the movie, yeah, that happened in Nightfall again. And Bane actually broke his back. Then John Paul Valley, yeah, I'm going into whole comic books, had to step up and uh, and become uh, Batman. He and he's the one who uh, who went crazy. And then Bruce Wayne finally actually ended up taking down Bane uh, at at the end of that arc. But yeah, I mean, like that. J- Nolan's actually taken everything from the comic books. If you didn't follow the comic books, you're an idiot. <laughs> well, the other thing too was the you know the, the second. Uh, you know, quote unquote, back up of Batman is more of an emotional thing, and uh, you know, trying to get himself mentally prepared to fight Bane, and because you know, the first time it wasn't too difficult for him to get back into physical shape. He, 
he had that that cool uh, knee brace that kind of fixed his leg, and uh, you know he got himself back into shape. And it was physically he was he was generally okay. It was he just wasn't mentally prepared to be Batman. Right. Uh, uh, next point. Um, one second as I go to the next page here. Got to get those page views for slash film. Right. Uh, uh, Alfred says goodbye to Bruce. This is one of the. This is actually one of the complaints that I thought was really bizarre. Um, because I thought that scene where Alfred says, "You know what, Bruce? If you're going to do this, I can't do this." Um, I thought that was a really well done scene emotionally, and I thought it really it really hit home for me. Yeah, I thought that was a great scene. Um, you know, like Alfred said goodbye to Bruce. Yeah, it's never really happened in the comic books, but that was a great scene. You know, like. Alfred saying, "Hey, look, uh, who was the? Uh, I'm I'm forgetting her name. The actress that, that exploded in uh, in Dark Knight. Oh, uh, uh, Gyllenhaal. Yeah, Maggie Mag- Gyllenhaal. Yeah, I was, th- I was thinking it was uh, it was Tom Cruise's ex wife. Um, <laughs> <laughs> sorry, uh, Mag- Maggie Maggie Gyllenhaal. Um, you know, like I, she left that note for him saying, like, hey, I hope that one day you don't have to be Batman anymore." You know, Alfred left because he didn't want him to be Batman anymore. It was a great scene. I, like, there's there's no reason to get pissed about that. Yeah, and Brent um, kind of pointed something out because uh, they they were complaining also that 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 conversation that they had was just outside the Batcave. And uh, Brent wrote, uh, "Yes, the hallway outside the Batcave. Really, the space in between where Bruce is going to refuse to accept that he has to become a real person." Uh, the Batcave and the home where Alfred talks about having loved Bruce since he was a boy and his need for him not to be Batman. Um, so yeah, it, you know, just it, it makes sense from a story point or as a symbolic uh, place to have that conversation. Uh, why why would the we, SEC just overturn Bane's fraudulent trades? Mike, yeah. do you want to take this one? Well, I'll just read from Brent's again because he 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 nailed it as usual. Uh, the the idea here, I assume, is just that they only needed it for long enough to get Bruce out of control of Wayne Enterprises. Assuming the SEC would move that quickly with no investigation is just as much of a stretch. The plan didn't really require that Bruce be flat broke once they got their hands on the bomb, just long enough to get their hands on said bomb. Right. Um, uh, this all right. This one. Uh, <laughs> this one really bothered me too. Uh, Christian Bale and Marion Cotillard have sex. Uh, 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 Marion playing uh, uh, Talia Al Ghul, um, as if there you, you really need any explanation why rich playboy, depressed freak Bruce Wayne is having sex with some woman. Right, like, <laughs> like what? Who, who cares? Oh, and by the way, Talia is actually the mother of Bruce's baby, who's the current Robin. So, uh, yeah, it's actually happened in comic books. Yeah. All right. Um, Next point, uh, so Batman is a street artist now. This is referring mostly to uh, the scene towards the end of the movie when Batman comes back from uh, the prison that Bane put him in and he sets off that uh, large-scale uh, fire art of uh, the bat sign. Um, you know, again, in, in terms of a story point, in, in terms of, like, logic, yeah, you know, kind of a weird thing to, to waste your time on doing, but, uh, you know, Bat- Brent m- mentioned this in his thing. Uh, you know, Batman's a symbol, and that's always the goal, or what the goal's been of uh, the Christopher Nolan Batman. So, right. Uh, and obviously, you know, with a big blockbuster action movie, comic book story, like... You need to have fire and explosions. Yeah, you need to, I mean, it, it's fine to stretch, you know, uh, stretch your imagination a little bit. Um, yeah, I didn't have any problem with that. Uh, this is another one that I really got bothered with. Uh, Bruce Wayne forgets to do proper background checks. Uh, this is referring to Selena Kyle working as a maid uh, at the start of the movie in, in the mansion. Um, there's no indication at all at any point that uh, the Wayne uh, Enterprises or the Wayne Manor hired her. Um, for all we know, she uh, just showed up someone and, and took their maid outfit or just yeah showed up in a maid outfit. Um, you know, just <laughs> one of those things where she's an expert cat burglar. Not too shocking that she somehow found her way in uh, working at M- Wayne Manor. Right. Uh, why, why does Bane take a break from his master plan to ship Bruce Wayne off to the desert? Um, <laughs> I don't know. Maybe because like that continues the whole storyline of Talia getting revenge for her father who was killed by Batman. Uh, also, making sure Batman is uh, as far away gone. as possible. <laughs> yeah, because oh yeah, there's only been one person who escaped that. <laughs> and also, and also, there's only one person that can really stop Bane. At, and Talia at this point, so why not get that guy out of there? 
I mean, the only other thing that he could have done is put a bullet in his head. And, like, yeah, that would probably be the end of a Batman movie and the death of a franchise. <laughs> uh, the next point here, how does Bruce Wayne get back to Gotham? Uh, this, one, this, <laughs> this one, at least, I can understand where they're coming from. Like, uh, you know, there's no, no real explanation about how he got back to Gotham. Um, but as, uh, again, I keep quoting Brent's uh, piece here. Uh, Bruce has always had assets and, quote, ways to get things done, unquote, all over the world. Plenty of stuff for Wayne has not been, quote, on the books, quote, unquote, uh, in his life. I'm just assuming he had a plane or something no one knew about. Okay, fine. If you want to be annoyed by this one, that's fair. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, it's totally fair to be, uh, but at the same time, like. It's the most, it's the most like, menial, like, like, most menial, ridiculous thing to get pissed off about this film. And, and and really, in a movie that's already two forty five, do you want a twenty or or even a ten minute segment where they show Bruce like, you know, hitching a ride in a cab and like <laughs> stowing away under a ship and getting like like who, yes, no one wants I want to see, see I, I want to see all of that. I want to see him riding train cars. I want to like come on, you want to see Bruce Wayne riding the rails? Right. I want to see Bruce Rain, Wayne riding the wet, uh the rails. Not, not, and, 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 and also the whales, apparently. I also want to see that, too. That would be a great movie. Bruce Wayne riding the whales. Uh, why does a prison exist where, prisoner, where people can possibly climb to freedom and by su- doing so free all the other prisoners? Which was directly addressed in the movie. Right, that's actually been directly addressed. And also, and, and, and also because they just want to kill your, 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 your soul. That's, that's why it's there. It, it exists... Also, because if you don't make it up, you die. Uh, this one I sort of uh, skipped over when I read it originally, so I'm going to read it out loud. Um, the post-Bane Gotham feels totally fake. Sure, it's cinematic to have Scarecrow hosting weird trials and sending people off into icy exile. But after that initial effective sequence of wanting rich people ripped out of their homes on Fifth Avenue, nothing about this Gotham seems real anymore. The streets are barren but nearly pristine. We, we see only rare glimpses of the occasional... Occasional Tumblr patrol, emergency relief trucks pull up with ease. There seems to be no disorder on the streets, but hell breaks loose indoors on a regular basis. This never felt like a fully realized place, only a series of gorgeous tableaus. I, I never, that never really popped in my head when I was watching it. Yeah, also because Bane announced martial law. He said that at the, uh, at the, at the football stadium. He said martial law is now, enact, uh, is now enacted. That's literally what he said at the football stadium after he, he, he killed the Russian guy. The doctor. Like, right, the doctor. Like He literally said martial law is now enacted. So. Uh, um, this one this is, a, this is another one that I think has some credence to it. Um, are, the Gotham police, uh, are the Gotham City Police Department and CIA really that dumb? Uh, this is referring to uh, the order sent to you know send all of the available police officers underground to uh, basically smoke out Bane and his uh, group, um, you know, does seem a little bit far fetched for a uh, any sort of uh, police organization to uh, commit all of their troops like that. Um, but <clears throat> you know, even then, even if that's in half or even you know four fifths. Uh, you know the the job's done. Like they, you know, basically they just want to get a, a the chunk of, of police officers off the streets. Right. The, like the entire pl- plan was just to get a large chunk of police off the streets, and they did it. Like it's it, it's exactly what you're supposed to do. Yeah. The CIA is is the Gotham police and CIA really that dumb? Probably. The police, you know, the police aren't used to dealing with somebody with a nuclear bomb, and the CIA like. At, at, by the time it happened, like literally by the time it happened, they couldn't make it. A, they, they they couldn't do anything, you know. Like once Bain killed the Russian scientist and it got armed. Oh yeah, and by the way, there's still a trigger trigger for the bomb that she can you know blow up anytime she wants. Um, yeah, uh, it, it, it yeah. I, I, I'm I'm offended by this question. Continue. Uh, most of the hand-to-hand combat is terrible. I'll, re- I'll read this one out loud. Um, do you remember how in those old Asian martial arts movies, a group of baddies would attack the protagonist one at a time? Do you remember how unintentionally comical that looked? That's how I feel whenever Batman fights anyone in this film. Uh, exception, his fights with Bane, which I thought were appropriately raw and intense. For the most part, all the bad guys have guns, and none of them use them. 
Each one just waits their turn to get their ass kicked by Batman. Now, I know why no one shoots all the action up close and nearly indecipherable, because if you had a wide-angle shot, seeing armed thugs stand idly by would look absolutely ridiculous. Thing is, no one's not incapable of staging good Batman action well. The truck chase scene in The Dark Knight was fantastic, as was the first time Batman takes out Falcone's men and begins. Unfortunately, the film was short on these sorts of transcendent moments. Maybe if there were more than one Batman scene per hour, we could have seen more than this. Uh, again, I had no problem with the combat scenes. Um, complaining about that in a comic book movie, I don't know. Okay, and, and, and also you're, you're complaining about the, those com- the, those scenes in this movie. Do you remember the uh, the train fight in the first movie? Which uh, which fight are you talking about? When Batman fought Roz on the train. Oh, okay, yeah. Yeah, yeah. You couldn't see shit, right? Right. Right, like. I'd rather see Batman throw ridiculous punches and you can see the punches and kicks than the the bullshit that we saw on the train. Yeah, and I also thought uh, specifically the stuff with Bane was uh, really it was well awesome. done. Oh, it was the, awesome. The way Bane threw those like body shots, oof. That was that was pretty stuff to watch. I mean I mean also think about this. Bane came in second place at uh at the, the Spartan uh, middleweight tournament in Warrior. <laughs> so, I mean, he knows how to fight. Yeah, dude knows how to throw some punches and kicks. Uh, right. The last point here, uh, and again, one that I vehemently de- disagree with, multiple ending syndrome, and I'll read this one again too. Uh, at least at the end of Return of the King, each ending got room to breathe, which, uh, to, to kind of uh, throw my own thoughts in here, I thought the continuous endings in Return of the King uh, were well were way overdone. And I thought most people, uh, that was kind of one of the complaints about the movie. Uh, But continuing, uh, here, within the span of five minutes, we're supposed to process the following. One, Batman dies in a blaze of glory. Two, Bruce Wayne donates all of his remaining assets to the betterment of children, tying up Blake's storyline. Three, Bruce Wayne apparently figured out how to program the autopilot on the bat. Four, Bruce Wayne survived the crash and is now enjoying a beautiful life in Lord knows where with Selena Kyle. Five, Alfred is totally cool with all this and does not lose his shit at all when he finds out. Uh, six, John Blake takes up the mantle as Batman with no training, no resources, or mentor. Also, no one notices that Bruce Wayne and Batman disappeared at the same time. What? I, I had zero problems with any of the endings. Uh, no, it was awesome. Was the ending least. was awesome. Yeah. And, 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 and also, when, 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 his, when his name is introduced as Robin, he's not going to be Batman, asshole. <laughs> Fucking morons. Um... The idea that Alfred would would want to lose his shit, I, I don't understand why. Considering that he the, wanted him to lose to leave Batman behind and yeah. see him at that di- that 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 restaurant in Venice, he literally and, got what he wanted. And, and also the the complaint that um, uh, what's which one's this complaint? Uh, shit! Oh, the that that Batman and Bruce Wayne die at the same time. Uh, is it, is it really out of the realm of possibility that in the chaos of the martial law that Bruce Wayne died and that Batman died at some other time? Like, it, I don't yeah, think Bruce, Bruce Wayne was, was sent to walk across the ice and he fell in uh, and he, he, he got death by exile and then Batman exploded. Like, boom, I just explained it. Yep. I just explained it. Now, I, I actually have one complaint of my own. This is the only complaint, the only major complaint that I have for the movie um, is, that final, is that, that final climactic scene when Batman is about to send the nuclear bomb over the bay with the bat. There's two minutes left on the countdown, and him and Selena Kyle have this bullshit chit chat. Like, bro, there's two minutes left. You need to get that nuclear bomb as far as you can away from the city. You have plenty of time. Well, if you're going to. I mean, obviously, it's a minor complaint, and it's not a huge deal, but it's one of those things when I'm sitting there watching the movie, I'm like, bro, come on, shut the bitch up, and let's get out of here. Save the city. Man, the the best was, he, like, you know, Commissioner Gordon just finally figures out who he is. Yeah. Like, it takes him, I'm, I'm guessing Batman, by this time, he's like 36, mid-30s. And it takes him 30 years to figure out that Batman is Bruce Wayne. <laughs> my, my other complaint, and this is also a minor one, uh, this is more uh, 
and I'm sure someone at at the studio was like, "All right, you need to put this line in there." Uh, when uh, when Alfred's trying to research Bane, he uh, tells Bruce, uh, "Bane was trained by Ra's al Ghul, the same man who trained you." Like, no shit. Like anyone who's watched the movie with any sort of eye knows who Ra's al Ghul is. Also, you don't need to tell Batman that. Exactly. Like, you don't, like, you don't, like, you don't need to think the second part because Batman knows he was trained by Ra's al Ghul. Like, he'd just be like, oh yeah, he was trained by Ra's al Ghul. And Batman would be like, oh shit. <laughs> wow. So yeah, those were minor complaints. Um, and, you know, after watching the first two Batman movies, um, there was there was some small stuff like that in those movies too that, that kind of had the same uh, complaints about. But, um, you know, easily overlooked in a movie like this. Um, my thing is, and I'm I'm going to try to see it, it again the next uh, week or two, but this may have usurped Star Wars as my favorite trilogy of all time. Uh, which Star Wars trilogy? Four, five, and six. Four, five, and six. I'll, I'll say four and five, definitely. Uh, I, I, the, sorry, four and five are ones that I'll have to think about. Uh, six, for sure, just because I thought that... Uh, that Jedi was awful. See, I didn't think Jedi was awful, um, but I, uh, I, I'm just talking about as a whole, as a trilogy, as a story. Um, and, you know, and part of it might be recency bias and how pumped I am about Batman and uh, how satisfying I thought this last movie was. But, um, and, and I want to say too that Star Wars has held that mantle for me for going on 20 years now. So, uh, kind of a big deal for me to uh, to make that sort of claim. So I want to uh, watch the movie again, um, but I watched Batman Begins probably three times this weekend, just um, through watching it on Friday night and then seeing it on TV a couple times the, the, the weekend, and uh, couldn't turn the TV off. So Now, here's a question. All the Batman films, I mean that from the, uh, from, from the Adam West, Burt Ward one, all the way up to these... So that's including the Joel Schumacher ones, or all of the the Star Trek films. Star Trek? Uh, I don't. I don't think I've seen all of the Star Trek films, so it's a bad comparison for me. I would okay. Probably- okay. Fine. Fine. All the Batman films or all the Star Wars films. So, uh, so, so you're including. So you're including Phantom Menace and Sith and see- Clone Wars. See, that's tough for me. As I was telling you before the show, Matt, uh, I, after Batman Begins came out, I was, uh, there was a, a Batman, Batman Returns double feature in my town, and I went to go see it. And in retrospect, those two movies are very bad. Um, and, and, you know, I know some people still like them. I thought um, they're just too over the top for me, too goofy. And then obviously the uh, the, the Schumacher films are... Um, in a league of their own, they're more of a cartoon than anything else. Um, I, I I found out recently that they were actually made for children. They were specifically made as uh, directed and marketed towards children. But at the same time, I watched <laughs> I watched episode one through three recently too, and the last couple of years I've been like, oh, they're probably not as bad as I remember them being. And then I watched them recently, and they are just as bad as I remember them being. They're worse. Yeah, they're worse. Like, I remember watching episode one. And there's like a 30 minute pod racing scene, and it just kills the pace of the movie. It doesn't fit the real, the, the tone of the Star Wars movies. Um, it it doesn't just cinematically. It doesn't really fit. It just it's just this weird 30 minutes of you know wanting to to market toys and video games um, afterwards. Um, uh, I would probably take the Batman movies. I think it's harder for me if you ask me, like, Batman versus James Bond. Okay, that, Batman versus James Bond. Uh, that's tough. Because there's, there's, some, there's some bad Bond movies. Oh, there's some horrendous James Bond movies. Like, George, G- George Lazenby, did you think he was a good Bond? <laughs> no. Well, the thing, the thing with Bond is this. I think there's less bad Bond movies, but I don't think anything touches the Nolan Batmans. Like, I don't think there's anything that good. Like, you know, just speaking from, for myself and, and what I've seen, uh, which came out during my childhood or, you know, my, uh, life cycle. 
Um, you know, like the Golden Eye is really good, but it doesn't hold the candle to any of the Batman movies. So I'd probably still take Batman. But it's fucking. So you're saying, so, so you're saying Batman? Yeah. Batman's the the best tril- best trilogy of all, all time. Yeah, I well, I don't want to commit to it yet. I want to see Dark Knight Rises again. I kind of want to give it a, a year or two to kind of to settle settle in. But I'm really leaning that way. Okay, so now now fo- follow up question: Is this a guaranteed uh, DVD purchase or Blu-ray Blu-ray purchase for you? Um, you know what? Now that you, now that you mention it, I actually don't have the first two, and because the last few years uh, with Netflix and with uh, other uh, streaming services, I, I don't buy as many DVDs as usual. Um, the only DVDs I've bought really are uh, Mad Men seasons and Louis seasons. Right. But uh, now that you mention it, I feel like I have to buy the Batman trilogy now, and maybe I'll just wait until this one comes out on DVD. And I can get a box set of it, but yeah, I, I think it's I think it's definitely going to be a DVD purchase. Okay, now last last little Batman fact. Uh, so um, Gotham City, it, everybody usually thinks that it's New York, not New York. It's actually based out of New Jersey, and it's right near Atlantic City, New Jersey. So in your face, Batman factoids getting dropped here on the Untethered podcast. <laughs> Is there anything else you want to say about the Dark Knight Rises, Matt? Before we move on to uh, to mixed martial arts. Yeah, yeah, I do. Uh, Anne Hathaway, you're not as good as Michelle Pfeiffer, and Michelle Pfeiffer, you weren't as good as Lee Merriweather. That's it. That's it. All right. Uh, I just upgraded my uh, Mac OS to Mountain Lion. How is it? Um, well, I was hoping to get it. Uh, up, upgraded for uh, the show, but uh, that didn't work out. So I'm on my PC for this. So I'm just gonna. Hopefully, it doesn't suck. What's, uh, the, what, what, what's the the big difference from uh, not, from lion to mountain lion? It's more of a. Uh, it, it's more of a. Um, it's not as big of a difference as previous upgrades. Um, this is right. more. Uh, there's a lot of stuff that kind of integrates with other iOS devices, um, so that's kind of a big deal. Um, there's some under the hood stuff that it's supposed to make it a little quicker and smoother, um, which is really the only reason I'm getting it. I have a Droid phone, so I don't really have any uh, integration stuff. I don't have an Apple TV. I don't have any anything like that. So, so I'm just doing it more for the hopeful uh, speed improvements, but. Um, but yeah, if you have an iPhone, I assume that it's uh, it's going to be a nice little upgrade for you. Ooh, I didn't even think about that. I gotta do that. So yeah, um, I think I get Siri finally. Are you gonna upgrade your what iPhone do you have? Uh, the iPhone four. Oh, I believe I get Siri finally. Well, hopefully you do. Um, I'm looking at my list here of of stuff. Um, stuff that you want to talk about? Hey, you yeah. know what? Let me skip over 149 because that, that was garbage. Well, there's one thing I want to talk about from 149. and that's Hector, Hector Lombard? Yeah. Um, you know, I've read a, I read a bunch of articles uh, before and after the event, and there's a, a handful of, of writers um, that kept insisting that Hector Lombard was this ultra-aggressive, super-fast, Middleweight who you know always pushed forward and always came at you and never let you know never let you rest and blah blah blah. But uh, I, I mean, obviously he has a bunch of first round finishes, but he's also fought a bunch of really bad fighters and he's all and he's had a lot of bad fights where he goes three, four, five rounds uh, with guys that he should not be going three, four, five rounds with. And he there's plenty of fights where he he doesn't just put pressure on you uh, from the start. So I was not shocked to see his performance. Um, I was a little shocked at the decision. Um, Fight Metric had uh, Tim Boach outlanding Lombard in every round, uh, significant strikes and total strikes. But um, when you actually look at the strikes that that seemed to land flush and do damage, uh, I thought Lombard still had the edge there. Um, that said, not unhappy with the decision. Uh, I had money on Tim Boach. I wanted Tim Boach to win because 
Hector Lombard, if you've heard any sort of stories about him, uh, seems like a total piece of shit outside of the octagon. And the gym is a full-on bully. Yeah. Um, heard, I've, I've heard a lot of bad stories about him. Uh, so, you know, I don't, I don't really... I wasn't really uh, feeling sorry for him when that decision was read. Um, at the same I laughed. I laughed when it happened. Yeah, I um, be, be, Because uh, during his entire... What was that winning streak? It was something like 19 fights or whatever it was. It was something like that, yeah. Yeah, like during an entire winning streak... Uh, where everybody ranked him in like the top ten, the guy never actually beat a top twenty-five fighter, ever. He, he's never beaten a top twenty-five fighter. It's crazy thing. It's it's not like he hadn't beat a top ten guy. He hadn't beat a guy in the top twenty-five. Right. Like the best p- person that he ever beat was Alexander Shlomenko. Shlomenko's really entertaining, and I'm not taking anything away from him. But uh, you know, if, if he, he was a step down from Lombard. And, uh, and Lombard, apparently, he's a step down from the best of the best in the UFC. I mean, where do you put... I mean, unless Lombard wants to drop down to 170, which I doubt, just with how beefy he is, who who do you have him fight? Um, I'm going to check. Like, he wants to fight Mark Munoz. He doesn't deserve Mark Munoz. You know what? I wouldn't mind that fight, though. I mean, I think... Uh, um. You know the the thing about that fight is it either proves that Mark Munoz or it either uh, kind of redempts Mark Munoz for what happened to to Chris Weidman or it uh, you know proves that Hector Lombard is a legitimate uh, middleweight in the UFC. Um, like I like to see him versus Chris Lieben when Lieben finally returns. Yeah, I wouldn't mind that fight either. I think uh, that's a good fight. I think that's a good fight. Um, but I mean, like, fuck, man, like. This is somebody that everybody was talking about having a title shot against Anderson Silva if he beat Boach. You know what? And I always thought that was very weird. Like, I wouldn't have minded it. Um, I, I think a lot of the reason why the UFC wanted that fight was to bury Bellator. Um, very, It's a very Vince McMahon move. Um, because I don't think there's any way Hector Lombard beats Anderson Silva. Oh, the, dude, there's, there's zero possibility that he beats Anderson Silva. I mean, just, just the reach alone and, and Anderson's control of distance. I mean, that right there is, that's it. And, oh, and Anderson's chin and Anderson's just being, he, Anderson's a heavyweight, really. Or he's a really, really big, light heavyweight. Um, like, it's not even close. Anderson's like 15 levels above Hector Lombard. 15. Well, and the crazy thing I've heard about Lombard, um, First, uh, I think this came from Matt Bishop told me, uh, he got a, the information from somewhere, that uh, Lombard has a cut of the pay-per-view. And the other thing, uh, someone on, on Twitter, trying to find who it was, um, he, he didn't differentiate what this meant, but um, he said that Lombard has some sort of, of two-loss uh, clause in his contract where the UFC can't cut him right now. I wasn't I asked if that meant that Lombard needed two losses in a row or if it was just two losses on his deal. Uh, I guess it's an eight-fight deal. Um, but if it's two losses just on the contract as a whole, that clause is pretty much worthless. It's like losing the first game in a playoff series where you have home court advantage. You've lost that, – that's it. Like You've lost home court advantage unless you uh, win the next couple games. Um, so, yeah, very very interesting that – the UFC, if if those reports are true about his contract, eight fights, um, has some sort of two fight or two loss clause, and gets a pay per view cut. Uh, very interesting that the UFC was willing to give him that much. Yeah, uh, I doubt. I, I, one, I mean, I, I don't know where where Bishop got that uh, that information. Um, I would doubt that. Uh, just just from knowing who Zufa actually gives pay per view cuts to. Right. Um, I, I doubt that they would give somebody a brand new newcomer who's never faced any top tier guys um, a cut of pay per view. Um, I just don't believe that's that that's the case. I could be completely wrong. I'm just uh, my opinion and knowing who Zufa gives a uh, pay per view cut to. I just don't see it. Um, I know that his deal was like something like fifty fifty or seventy five seventy five. Uh, so so again, like I just don't see him getting a pay per view cut. Uh, the, the two, the two cut thing, maybe, um, I don't 
fuck, I mean, shit. Eight fights is, is a long contract. It's a really long contract, and it's like the type of contract that Rich Franklin signed back in 2005, 2006, when he was making 32-32. You know, well, like... The, the thing about that contract, though, is, you know, it might be an eight-fight contract, but unless those eight fights are guaranteed, it doesn't really mean a whole lot. I mean, you, you can well, give a guy... Like, give like, a, like a two-fight, but, I mean, if that, if that two-loss clause is actually true, like, then it really can work out to be... Uh, eight fights, and I just don't. I, I just don't see that happening. I don't think that there's any manager in MMA that can bend Zufa over a barrel like that. Well, and again, unless it's a two fight, unless it's two consecutive losses, I don't think that clause really means anything. Um, right. Especially after losing his first fight. I mean, now he's just, you know, he can't lose. And if he wasn't going to lose, they weren't going to cut him anyway. So it doesn't really matter. Mm. Um, and and you know yeah the, the pay per view cut thing also seems a little odd to me. Um, maybe maybe it's one of those things where if he got into a main event or got a title shot, it would kick in. Um, I'm not sure uh, how. It, it very it seems very odd for him to get a pay per view cut right away, not having any sort of uh, recognition in the United States. You know as a as a national fighter, um, you know never headlining a pay per view before. Like just seems like an odd thing to give him right off the bat. Yeah, that, that, that's basically my issue. I just don't think that they give it to somebody right off the bat. Um, in related news, uh, with with the loss, um, you know, it really seemed like the UFC was ready to give Lombard a title shot if he won. Uh, Dana White was was uh, beside himself at the press conference. Um, I I really think that the rest of the evening uh, wouldn't have mattered if the Lombard Boach fight was a little more to what he thought it was, and if Lombard had won. Um, I think that those two things kind of uh, really played into his uh, reaction to the fight, a reaction to the card uh, in the press conference. But now the question is, who fights Anderson Silva? Um, Dana's already said that he he doesn't feel like Tim Boach is the guy, which really leaves, to me, only Chris Weidman, unless they're going to wait to see what happens with, with Michael Bisping. I mean, I, I think that, that Weidman is the guy that should get it, um, supposedly Anderson Silva, uh, we just posted about it on Bleacher Report. Uh, Anderson Silva really only wants to fight George St. Pierre. Um, so I mean, it, it's, it's a weird situation that the UFC is right now. Um, that the UFC is in, um, Chael Sonnen, I, I believe has crowned, uh, Chris Weidman to be the next, uh, the next challenger. You know, he, he's kind of taken it on himself to say, uh, to throw his hat in with, uh, with Weidman. Um, I, I just I mean, shit, like who, who does the UFC have? Everyone's talking about this Belfour, uh, you know, Belcher fight and Vitor believes that beating Alan Belcher is going to give him a title shot. There's just, uh, there's not many ch- uh, choices except for Chris Weidman. Well, I, my thing with Weidman is that, you know, if he really wants to fight and if the UFC feels like they don't have any other option, you know, whatever, give him the fight. Um, I, I would personally like to see Weidman take another couple fights. Um, you know, he's obviously extremely talented. Um, you know, whatever you think of Mark Munoz, the, the kind of performance he put on against Munoz is is really eye-opening. Um, but at the same time, he's he still only has nine UFC fights or nine fights in MMA. Uh, I think he's only got four or five in the UFC. Uh, that might be – that's just off the top of my head. Um, but when you're about to fight the guy who's been lauded as the pound for pound greatest fighter in the world over the last four or five years, uh, and now being heralded as the greatest fighter of all time, you know, I don't mind seeing a guy like Chris Weidman take another two fights, another three fights. Um, you know, even if it's against a couple of guys that, you know, some people might view as, uh, you know, a waste of his time. I, I, I don't mind seeing that guy season himself a little more. And really get prepared to fight a guy like Silva, especially since Anderson's known for <clears throat> really only fighting twice a year at, at the most. Um, you know, it's not like you're really risking a lot if you uh, you know put Weidman Silva on hold. I mean, I mean, here, here's the thing: can we at least agree that uh, that Weidman's probably the future of that division? Yeah, I mean, assuming uh, assuming Anderson Silva's only got two or three years left, uh, I the, the, here's the thing about Weidman though: he's already 29, so you know. He's really, I mean, at the same time, at, at the same time as I say all of this and he, he should take a couple more fights, he really also should be fighting as often as he can. Um, right. 
because once he gets to, you know, 31, 32, 33, um, you know, that's, those are the last prime years of his career athletically. And then it's going to start to go downhill. Obviously, you know, people always want to bring up Randy Couture, bring up Anderson Silva, but you know, those guys are exceptions and those guys are superstars and legends for a reason. I mean, that's why, uh, you know, if you think Chris Weidman's going to be in that same class of fighter, uh, you know, sure. He, he can probably, uh, you know, plan his career appropriately, but you know, do you really want to bet on being a legend? Um, so, um, you know, I'm kind of talking out of both sides of my mouth here, but, um, but it makes sense. I mean, what you're saying is makes sense. I mean, for, for me, I think that Weidman out of all the, the middleweights not named Anderson Silva, uh, he has the best. And, and, I, and I'm assuming that Chelsea Sonnen, and, uh, you know, he, he's, he's thinking about moving up to 205. So, I'm taking him out of the uh, the middleweight discussion. Um, I, I think that when you remove uh, Anderson from the middleweight division, you, like who who do you have left right now at the top? You have Chris Weidman, Brian Stan, and those are the only two guys that. Or, and Tim Boach. Those are the three guys that current. Oh, I'm sorry, Brian Stan, Chris Weidman, uh, Tim Boach, and Alan Belcher. Those are the four guys. That are currently uh, at the top of the division, uh, riding win streaks um, or riding wins. Uh, Michael Bisping is fighting Brian Stan. He's coming up of a, uh, coming off of a loss. Uh, Vitor Belfour is fighting uh, Alan Belcher. He's coming off of the front kick KO. Uh, am I missing anybody? Uh, Yushin Okami. He hasn't fought since getting knocked out by uh, by uh, by Stan Boach. by Boach. Wait. By Boach. Okami? Yeah, he hasn't yeah. fought since, since since getting knocked out by Boach. Um, you, you know, like th- there's not much really for him. Um, you know, it, it's, if Anderson decides that he, that he really is now chasing super fights, I'd be super okay with that. Yeah, and you know, if if you took a a if you put it together a tournament at middleweight, uh, you, you assume Anderson Silva retires today. Uh, <clears throat> also assume that either. Chow Sonnen isn't allowed in, or he's moving up to 205, which is one of the rumors f- floating around about him. Uh, you take guys, uh, I'm just going to go through the top eight guys after that. Uh, Munoz, Belfort, Bisping, Boach, Rockhold, we'll just assume that he can fight in the UFC. Uh, Okami, Weidman, and Stan. Uh, I-, I think Chris Weidman comes out of that tournament as the winner more times than not. Yeah, I mean, the, the only other really interesting fight in that tournament, uh, you know, the tournament aspect he just hypothetically created, um, you know, the challenge Anderson would be, uh, in my opinion, would be Luke Rockhold. Yeah, I mean, see, I, I just, uh, I would, again, kind of like uh, Lombard, I'd like to see Rockhold fight any one of the guys on that list. Um, <clears throat> you know, I, I, you know, I, he, he won against Kennedy pretty convincingly a couple weeks ago, but I, it wasn't so convincingly that I thought, Oh, that's an interesting fight for Anderson Silva. All right. I mean, I mean, Luke Rockhold is in a weird situation. Like, I'm a, I'm a I'm a personal friend of Tim Kennedy, so I say this um, as a disclaimer. I think that Tim just didn't look good against Luke at all. Uh, he, you know, Luke's uh, abnormally huge for middleweight, um, just like Anderson. Uh, Tim probably should be fighting at 170. Uh, but Tim also, he had nothing for Luke anywhere except for kind of on the ground keeping top control. Uh, Luke, I think, has the, the stand-up skills and the chin to, uh, to make a fun fight with Anderson. But I just don't see it's going to be a... Uh, like, I, I don't know. We're, we're talking hypothetical fights. And the only one that, that I think that I'm really interested in seeing Anderson fight right now is against uh, Chris Weidman. And again, I, I agree with you. I think that Weidman needs... Uh, at least one more fight before taking on the champ. I'd personally like to see him versus Belfort. Yeah, I wouldn't mind that. Uh, you know, another reason that Weidman should probably take another fight is that his win over Munoz was on a Wednesday on Fuel TV uh, in a fight that probably, you know, a couple hundred thousand people saw maybe. Um, 200,000 200, people. Yeah, so, um, you know, just from a, a, a promotional aspect, it seems uh, kind of backwards to give a guy whose best win came on a card that no one really saw um, to put him in a main event on a pay-per-view with Anderson Silva. Uh, I do want to say, Matt, I think the the worst part about Tim Kennedy's fight was those trunks, those diaper trunks. Oh, those are terrible. Those those soggy, gross, loose-fitting 
bicycle shorts that really, and I was joking about it on Twitter, but I was serious at the same time. Like they were really disgusting. Yeah, those were those were terrible. Like straight god awful. And uh, I don't know why he would wear those because he's never won those shorts before, right? Uh, I I I always remember him being a board shorts guy. Yeah, he's always been a board shorts guy. Now, at, at the same time, I, I actually prefer fighters to wear bicycle shorts um, because then you avoid any notion of, of grabbing shorts or of any sort of impropriety in that regard. Um, obviously, they look better on some guys than others. Um, you know, I wouldn't want to see Cole Conrad in a pair of bike shorts. Um, at the same time, in terms of... Uh, it's always kind of been weird to me that that... Uh, commissions have you know outlawed key pants and, and pants below, uh, but you're still given kind of a wide range of, of short options. It seems like uh, it, it would make sense for the commissions to say this is the kind of short you can wear and that's it. I mean, the commission actually does have that ability. They, well, yeah, they, I'm saying it's weird that they haven't that that's something that commissions haven't uh, taken that for that extra step. I mean, I mean, those were just a little bit shorter than Valley Tudor shorts, right? The uh, the Kennedy shorts. Yeah, yeah. I mean, those were shorter than Valley Tudo shorts, but a little longer than uh, than what's it called? Than uh, than what's it called? Than uh, like the. Who am I thinking of? Dennis Hallman's. Yeah. Like those weren't as offensive as Dennis Hallman's. No, no, no. I mean, they weren't. Yeah, I mean, they weren't even. They had that high. Uh, they're kind of high on the on the the hip too. So like, it it, it wasn't. <clears throat> It wasn't disgusting in that aspect. It was disgusting in how they <laughs> they got covered in sweat and became this weird off white. And they, for some reason, weren't skin tight. They were really loose, and it was just it looked like a diaper. <laughs> so yeah, bad, like an adult so diaper. Bad. It was so bad. Um, what's next? Oh, big news! Uh, the last couple of days here, uh, Daniel Cormier has an opponent. It's Tim Sylvia. Oh, yes. no, it's, no, it's not. It's Frank Mir. I'm still. I'm actually really, really stoked for this fight. Yeah, um, I'm sure Mir got a nice little uh, bonus from the UFC for for taking taking them up on this offer. Uh, really, just a a really good fight for Cormier. Um, a really nice uh, step uh, after his win over Barnett. You know, I don't necessarily think Mir is a step up in competition. He's a step up in name, um, probably more of a lateral move in terms of competition. A little, a different skill set to deal with, um, mm-hmm. but I think uh, you know it's a it's a fight that uh, if Cormier was coming into the UFC, I think that's a fight that people would kind of push for. And uh, I, I just like uh, I, th- I think it's an inspired bit of matchmaking. That's what I would uh, say about it. I think it's a great fight. Uh, I think that Cormier still beats him pretty handedly. Uh, but it's an interesting fight because you get to see how Cormier will react to somebody who uh, is not only bigger than him, but somebody who uh, has the ability to, you know, not not shoot a takedown and and you know take his, you know, take him down and like shooting a strong double. But Frank Mir, if he's going to fail on a takedown, he'll roll for a knee. Yeah, it's a guy that presents uh, s- some interesting options uh, for for Cormier to deal with. I, I don't see any way that Cormier doesn't just beat the shit out of him. Yeah, I mean the, the 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 one fight that I'm really excited for for uh, for Cormier when he finally makes it into the UFC, and I think that he's going to walk through Mir, is uh, I, I want to see how Cormier does against Junior Dos Santos. That's I'm already looking ahead to that. Yeah, and I think it's fair to say that assuming Dos Santos beats uh, Velasquez in their rematch, um, which I don't think is necessarily safe to assume, but assuming he does. Um, this fight, I think, is Zufa's way of setting him up uh, for a, an immediate title shot when he gets in the UFC. The one thing that Cormier did say is that if uh, if Kane does beat uh, JDS, he'll think about moving down to uh, to what's called to two hundred uh, five. Yeah, I, I heard that as well. He would rather fight John Jones than fight Kane Velasquez. Right. Which <coughs> also an amazing fight that I really want to see. Yeah. Really, anything that Cormier is doing, really. Yeah. <laughs> well, Cormier's got that 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 new kid in school thing where you know you kind of want to see what he's got. Right. Exactly. Um, 
it's always <clears throat> it, it, even with Lombard. To be fair, to be fair to Hector Lombard, him coming into the UFC, uh, I like because it gives a, a fresh look for for a lot of matchups. Um, right. and the same thing with Cormier coming into the UFC. It just gives a lot of cool fresh matchups um, at at the heavyweight division. And you know, I'm almost rooting against Cain Velasquez because I want to see Cormier get that title shot. Yeah, I think that most of us want to see that fight. Um, but I would not be upset to see Cain Velasquez win. And I, I think people are going to be surprised at how that second fight's going to look. I don't think it's going to look the same. Uh, and, I'm, and by that, I mean it's not going to look like a minute. <laughs> but, uh, but, but, I'm, but I'm still picking uh, JDS to win. Yeah, I think it's fair. I, I, I do love that people say, well, oh, you know, JDS knocked him out in the first round, so uh, obviously he's just going to walk through this guy. Um, you know, if there's one type of fight that you can't really take a lot from when you talk about a rematch, it's a 90 second sort of flash knockout, especially when a guy is coming off over a year, um, uh, of recovery of a a pretty significant shoulder injury. Right. Um, and obviously Velasquez came back and and really (laughs) beat the shit out of Antonio Silva in his return fight. So, uh, so yeah, I, I expect that fight to look a lot different. Um, it, you know, it's all going to hinge on, to me, uh, you know, how successful Kane is wrestling with him. Um, to this point, we've seen, uh, we've seen Dos Santos have uh, almost a Chuck Liddell like ability to to stay on his feet. Um, I still don't think he's fought a wrestler, you know, close to to Velasquez outside of the first Velasquez fight. Um, so yeah, I'm. I'm uh, that's another good fight, and you know, like I said, I'm, I'm going to probably root for Joe Santos just because I want to see that Cormier fight, but uh, I will not be upset if uh, Cain Velasquez wins. Right. Now, uh, now, now, now the, the, the recently announced uh, Alan Belcher, Vitor Belfort fight, how do you, like, there was a discussion last night between myself, Tim Burke, and, uh, and Neil Manich. Um, how do you see that fight going out? Um, because Tim's of the, under, uh, under the impression that uh, Vitor just completely stomps um, Alan Belcher. See, I don't think uh, I don't think either of them is going to completely stop the other. I I like. I think I like Belcher in the fight. I think Belcher's a little more dynamic of a striker. I think people still, at a certain to, to a certain degree, underrate how how good he is. Um, and the, you know the thing about Vitor is if you can uh, if you can put pressure on him, if you can hit him, if you can kind of you know show him that that you know you're going to be able to land on him. You know he's a guy that that. That doesn't always react to that as well as uh, as he probably should. Um, you know, at the same time, I would not be surprised if Vitor came out and you know landed a left hand at some point and and put Belcher on the mat. But uh, I, I like Belcher. I, I think he's. I want to say he's younger than than Belfort. I think that's going to be um, something that comes into play because Vitor's what, 34, 35 now. Yep. Um, you know, and I just think he's a more dynamic striker on the feet. I I just. Uh, yeah, I, I I like Belcher in the fight, and I know you do too. Yeah, I, I, I'm picking Alan Belcher. I think that he uh, he he he's better at Vitor, disappointed everything. That's uh, that, that's the way I'm looking at it. That is an interesting. Uh... Like like the the only thing that, that I would give uh, Vitor the the advantage in is hand speed, but I think that Alan has demonstrated a better chin. He's demonstrated better ground skills. He has definitely better kicks. Uh, I'd say that they have similar knockout power, and I think that Allen is better submissions. Also, uh, Allen Belcher's fucking huge. Yeah, Allen Belcher's a big dude. <clears throat> He's also got the advantage in, in bad Johnny Cash tattoos, so right. which is always a pivotal. You know, the UFC is keys to the cage. Kind of wish they would have tattoos as one of the options. Don't know why they don't do it. Yeah, it really should be there. Yeah. Um, one of the things I wanted to touch on, and I don't know, did you read this article that your colleague Jeremy Botta wrote about the, the new face of the UFC? No, I actually missed that. I was still uh, dealing with what I was dealing with. Um, let's see if I can find a... So, uh, let's see. I'll, p- I'll pick this article up halfway through here. Um, but I'm not- <laughs> about Dana White. I'm talking about the fighter that the UFC consistently pushes in the media. They're on the covers of magazines. They're cage-sided at every show, whether they're involved with the event or not. 
they're being pushed to the mainstream and to the moon, and they're keeping a publicity tour schedule that would seemingly make a real training camp all but impossible. Who is that fighter, right now, in 2012? My answer may surprise you. It's Ronda Rousey. Yes, I know she's not actually in the UFC, but that's a minor equivalent point. I'd like to note that that is a major equivalent point. Uh, you must remember that White and Lorenzo Fertitta have historically pushed their company brand as the entire sport. Blah, 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 blah. Blah, blah. No other Zufa employee has done as much media as Rousey, at least not in the last few months. Rousey's everywhere you turn, doing radio and TV and the ESPYs on the, and on the cover of ESPN's Body Issue. She's got killer looks to go along with a deep athletic pedigree and undeniable talent in a sport. She just started training a few years ago. She also has a willingness to say the outlandish or brutally honest things that most other fighters strive to avoid, like the plague. Uh, you may point to guys like Anderson Silva and John Jones. Yes, they are very big stars, much bigger than Ozzy on a global level. But Silva doesn't speak English and does very few interviews, while Jones has been kept under lock and key for the last few months over his legal issues. Uh, it doesn't matter that Z Rousey isn't in the UFC. She's still one of the most public and most push faces of the entire Zufa brand. And she keeps winning her fights and continues being a controversial and magnetic figure in the media. Rousey will enter the UFC within the next two years, once the Showtime deal expires, as one of the biggest superstars in the sport. Uh, he, he's not wrong, though. Um, Ronda, Ronda has been on a ridiculous media tour. Um, Zufa is really pushing her and not... Uh, you know, more so than anybody else that they have on Strike Force. Uh, like she, she was, she had an interview at UFC 148 with the entire Brazilian media, and there was probably 120 Brazilian media there. I was actually one of the people that actually was in for that interview. I posted a quote from it today uh, for my first story back. Um, Ronda Rousey, she is really being pushed by Zufa as being one of the faces of their organization. Uh, they're probably looking for the end of the strike force deal and then bring her over and start using her in the UFC. So I don't think that he's wrong. <clears throat> I mean, right now though, you, you, I mean, that's my issue with the article is that right now, I don't think you can really make a case that Ronda Rousey is quote unquote, the face of the UFC. Yeah, I mean, it's not the face of the UFC right now. I'd say that, that, that if you're really looking at somebody who the UFC has been pushing as the face of their organization, it's still either, I mean, and we're basing it on the Fuel TV stuff and everything like that. The face of the organization is really, it's a combination of Brian Stan, Rashad Evans, and, uh, and Chael Sonnen. <laughs> I love you, Matt Ross. I'm sorry, I'm basing it on facts. Uh, I, I think the answer is still George St. Pierre. No, uh, George St. Pierre hasn't been doing shit. Considering George was, was included on a countdown show or a primetime special for a fight he was not involved in. Significant time. Okay, Tito Ortiz was involved in a, in a special about a boxing match that never happened. I can, and, I can, make the, I can, I can say the same thing too, sir. And considering George's uh, sponsorship deals with, with places like Gatorade and Nike and doing commercials for the the new Google uh, Nexus tablet, right? Uh, and 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 uh, and Rashad Evans sponsorship deals with Microsoft, and uh, <coughs> and and he also is in a Microsoft uh, 360 commercial, Xbox 360 commercial. And yeah, George I, I, Harris uh, being pretty much guaranteed to sell seven hundred thousand pay per views every time it goes out. And Rashad Evans always um, sells at least five hundred thousand, and, 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 and he made and he made five and he made five million dollars on one fight. <laughs> yeah, I could make I could play the same game, man. And it's always going to be Rashad Evans is one of the faces of that organization, whether fans like him or not. You will always buy a Rashad Evans fight. When we're talking about the face of the organization, oh, then Stan White. Uh, well, yeah, but we're talking. Yeah, that's true. But Bader does not want to talk about Dana White. He, he, specifically he, wanted, he, he actually spoke about him yesterday or this morning, uh, saying that, that Dana, that does he have to take a, 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 a step back or something like that. I'm still, uh, I'm still getting my head back, so I'm, uh, I'm not really reading anything. Um, but, I mean, shit, man, look, honestly, it, yeah, the face of the UFC right now is still probably uh, George St. Pierre, but they're making... Uh, an actual effort to start pushing other people besides him. No, and I think that's a smart thing to do. Um, you know, George is getting 
I believe he's he's uh, he's past thirty now, or he's turning thirty soon. Um, you know, he's coming off a pretty significant knee injury. He seems to have recovered tremendously well from that knee injury. Um, but um, you know, obviously, you know, obviously, John Jones is the guy that they are targeting to be the guy. Um, as long as he stays out of legal trouble and continues to fight as well as he has, I mean, he's going. He's hopefully going to be their their biggest superstar. Um, I, I was, we're, we're also basing this off, off of the you know the United States. I'd say that uh, you know their biggest their biggest superstar soon will probably be Junior Dos Santos. And I'm basing it on the fact that the uh, you know the Globo deal and you know how how the Brazilian media is. I'd say that that right now the UFC is bigger in Brazil than it is in the United States. And so, really, I'd say that Junior Dos Santos or Jose Aldo. Um, has a better chance and a bigger chance of being the uh, the face of that organization, um, you know, worldwide. Um, and the thing about the Rousey uh, thing is, is that I still don't have any confidence that the UFC wants to bring women into the octagon. Um, they want to bring her into the octagon. I'm I'm sure they do want to bring her into the octagon, but the the problem with that is, I mean, how many times can you sell Ronda Rousey against clearly overmatched competition that nobody knows? It's it's going to be tough. I think that that San Diego will will t- will say a lot. the The San Diego card um, in August, the against uh, Kaufman, that'll tell us a lot about Ronda Rousey. One, how she reacts to getting punched in the face. Because Sarah Kaufman punches really hard uh, by female standards. Um, and then also, I mean, just how much of a draw she is. Because that card, if you look at it on paper, it's not their strongest strike force card. No, but like, 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 saying something, but yeah. like, like, it, like it sounds funny, but you know, the Portland card that they just put on does a really strong card for them, at least on paper. It turned out to be complete garbage, but it was a strong card for them. Right. Well, and the I mean? thing about, and the thing about Rousey too, you know, you talked about, you know, we're going to see a lot of what's going to happen in the Kaufman fight. You know, you know, everyone wants to focus on the fact that, that she ended up arm barring the shit out of Misha Tate, but Misha had moments in that fight and she hit, <clears throat> she hit Ronda a couple of times, and I don't think Ronda looked very good on her feet uh, throwing punches. Um, you know, I, I think she obviously outclasses every woman at that weight class on the ground by a pretty wide margin right now. But you know, what I saw on the feet, I was not very impressed with, and I would not be surprised if Sarah Kaufman lands a couple couple punches. Uh, Ronda kind of freaks out, and I don't, I don't think she's going to freak out because she is sparring with men when she is doing stand-up. Um, but, I mean, got, kind of going back to the card, I mean, r- r- yeah, one, it's at the Valley View Casino Center, which is an awful venue. It's terrible. Uh, the card, as it is right now, Lumumba Sayers versus Anthony Smith. I don't know who either of those guys are. Uh, Ad- Adlan Amagov versus Keith Berry. Uh, Keith Berry. Um, so I'm, I'm assuming that he's, that he's, uh, that he's related to, uh, to Mayor Berry from... Uh, from uh, DC, uh, Hiroko uh, Yamanaka versus Jermaine uh, Duratamami. Yawn. Uh, Misha Tate versus Julie Kenzie. Julie Kenzie, that's a decent fight for female mixed martial arts. Ovin St. Peru versus TJ Cook. Who the fuck is TJ Cook? Tarek Sefadine versus Roger Bowling. Decent fight. That would have also that would have been on the uh, on a Strike Force Challengers card. And then uh, Jacare versus Derek Brunson. <laughs> Derek Brunson, everybody. I always think Derek Brunson is by the, the way last one of Doyle Brunson. Derek Brunson also lost his last fight in uh, in what's called. He actually lost his last fight not in Strike Force. He fought somewhere else uh, in like a regional card and he lost. <laughs> so like some. Let me actually pull it up because I've been reading about comic books the entire time. Let me actually pull up the who he fought. Uh, Derek Brunson. Derek Brunson, he fought and lost to Kendall Grove at Show Fight in Springfield, Missouri to the Show Fight Middleweight Championship. He lost a split decision. Uh, but I mean, like, so he's taking that. So he he lost to Kendall Grove, and now he's gonna fight. He's gonna fight uh, Jacare Souza. Jacare, another guy that I think would uh, 
<clears throat> you know, I don't think he's a, a a guy to beat Anderson Silva. Uh, he certainly has an interesting skill set to do so, but just another guy that I think in the UFC middleweight division just adds a lot of fun matchups. For instance, Jacare and Hector Lombard. That, that that's a decent fight. Also, uh, fuck. I mean, <laughs> like this sounds so bad. Like like Jacare versus uh, Mayhem Miller would have been good. That would have been a fun fight. You yeah. know, J- Jacare versus uh, the loser of Belcher and uh, and Belfour. That's a decent fight. Um, you know, I don't know, man. It, it, it's just one of those things where you go, like. That, that's such a weak card, and it's based completely around Ronda Rousey's ability to sell people on it. Yeah, it'll be interesting. I mean, obviously, we saw we've we've already seen that it's possible for a female mar- mixed martial artist to to really grab the attention of the mainstream. Um, Gina Carano obviously has done that. Uh, she, in terms of her fight career, that was ended when she got destroyed by. Uh, cyborg female cyborg but um you know there's there's a precedent there of, of of being able to generate interest um the problem is is that carano had that that big fight to look forward to with cyborg um, right. she had a foil i i don't think rousey has one and i don't think she's <clears throat> as far as i know there's there's not really one <clears throat> on the horizon for her uh, yeah i mean i mean chris cyborg maybe can can she get down to 135 or is or is Rousey willing to go up to one forty five? Probably not. I don't think that she that she's willing to go back up. Um, you know, I, I mean, and, and Chris, I mean, she had so much trouble making one forty five. Right. You know, you, now you're saying cut an additional ten pounds. Like, come on. And that's yeah. that's even saying that that she's going to come back after this uh, the steroid suspension. Like, where part of it with with discussions that I've had with people are, like. You know, offline and like, is that you know was was this a a, a thing where um, Alahara was basically uh, you know keeping her on cycle or did she start cycling once Alahara went back to Brazil? So like, it, it, like it's basically hey, she was either doing steroids the entire time and her old strength and conditioning coach was just way smarter. Or she started doing them after he left and went be- went down to Brazil, and now it's kind of like, you know, uh, she 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 is just t- getting really shitty advice from people and she's taking it. Right. Uh, I want to end the show, Matt, <clears throat> on a couple things here, a couple of non MMA related things. Okay. I don't know if I don't know if you were following my Twitter last night, but I, I marathon. I, I marathoned. Uh, girls, I I I'd watched the pre the the pilot episode a while ago. I decided to watch the remaining nine uh, for personal reasons, uh, for 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 certain reasons. But uh, have you seen the show at all? Are you I haven't seen I haven't seen any of it. Uh, outside of a couple nice hoot shots, I, I would recommend you do not watch it. That I do not do not do not donut do not watch it. Donut donut watch it. Don't it hurts watch. hurts donut hurts donut. Speaking of donuts, though, you should watch, and I know you do watch, Louis. a little show that's coming on tonight. <laughs> is it a show called Louie? It is a show called Louie. I've never heard of it. Never heard of it? <laughs> no. Can you tell me about it? it it's, a, it's, a nice little, uh, it's a nice little show by Louis C.K. that uh, I don't think compares to any other TV show I've ever seen, and certainly nothing on TV right now. Um, it, there's really no way to describe it except that it's a really enjoyable 22 minutes of television. Now, now, did you get tickets to go see him when he comes uh, when he's on tour? I did. Um, I actually have a funny story about that. Okay. Um, so I ordered tickets. Uh, I, I found out through an email from Louis, and tickets were on sale. I was in a class, so I could not order at the time. I went home. Uh, I decided, fuck it, I'm just going to buy four tickets. And then I'll find people to come with me because I know I'm going to be able to find people to come with me. Right, I did the same thing. Yeah. Um, so I bought tickets, and I, I thought that the there, there was two shows scheduled. There was one for November 9th and November 16th, I believe. Right. And the show for November 9th was seemed to be sold out. So I I tried to buy tickets for the November 16th show, which was not sold out. 
I tried to use my, my PayPal debit card twice, and it didn't go through. So I used my regular um, bank debit card, uh, and that went through fine. Now here's where it gets kind of weird. The PayPal charges stayed on my account for a few days uh, as pending, which is normal. Uh, so I emailed PayPal. I'm like, hey, uh, this, these transactions didn't go through. I was wondering when these funds will be available back to me. And they took care of it right away. I then checked a couple of days later my Chase account and found that the money had never been taken out for the transaction that did go through. And I know that transaction went through because I have the tickets in my email. Ready. <laughs> So I actually, I would never do this for anyone else, only because it's Louis C.K., only because of the way he's doing this. I actually emailed the ticket provider, and I'm like, hey, I have these tickets, and I don't think you took the money. Is there any way for you to like rectify this? And I haven't heard from them, and it's been probably a month at this point. So, so, you, got, so you got free tickets. So I either got free tickets, or I'm going to get fucked at the door. I or, really, you or, or you don't have any tickets. Right. I either have free tickets or no tickets. All right. And that's so, scary. That, that is scary. Uh, is, is the Chicago show before or after the Austin show? Uh, I'm not sure. When is the Austin show? Somewhere, Sometime in December. Oh, well, that would be the Chicago show is before then. Okay. So if you get fucked at the door, I have an extra ticket, and I'll hang on to it. All right. And if you can't go, then you can fly down to Austin and you can go see him. That's, uh, that's a deal, sir. All right. Awesome. Well, Matt, it's, it's been always a, a pleasure. It's been a pleasurable seventy-five minutes. Is there anything else uh, you want to say before we get out of here? No, I'm good, man. I'm uh, I'm, I'm gonna finish watching this documentary on the AWA, and then uh, start transcribing an hour-long interview with the CEO of Bad Boy. Oh, and that's always the best part of writing online. Uh, well, hopefully we'll get uh, Derek back next week. Uh, hopefully his work schedule and, and school schedule doesn't get fucked uh, for our show. Uh, but for Matt and for our producer, Erica, we will see you next week. See you now or see you on another time. Mm-hmm.